Good afternoon to everyone, uh, and thank you for being here. It's been a power-packed morning with a whole lot of sessions and uh, non-stop discussions, very pertinent. I'm sure a lot of you have taken away a lot of things uh, from the morning discussions, a lot of discussions on policy and governance. Uh, here on, I uh, hope all of you have had lunch. Uh, some of us have not had the privilege, but uh, very, very happy about being here, bringing all these extremely uh, wonderful panelists for all of you. Um, we are now at a point where we are moving into our next theme for the skill development and entrepreneurship track, which is uh, innovation and digital transformation in the skilling sector. Uh, very pleased to uh, introduce the next topic for our panelists, which is employing disruptive thinking and platform economies to drive progress in the skilling sector. Uh, for this panel, uh, one of the things that the panel will aim to do is to bring out how the skilling ecosystem can benefit from technology frameworks and platform economies to bring about a step change in delivering impact and quality skilling outcomes at scale. How can scale not be there if technology is at play? Uh, introducing our panelists today, uh, we have Kamya Chandra. Uh, Kamya is uh, building digital societal platforms at uh, iSpirit Foundation. Kamya is passionate about building innovative, digitally powered platforms that enable entire ecosystems to solve for societal challenges at scale and helps redesign and help redesign market incentive structures to optimize outcomes for the poorest. She has been in the dev sector for a decade and has worked with World Bank, BCG, and the Ministry of Rural Development. Welcome, Kamya. Our next panelist is Megha Agarwal. Uh, Megha is a young, and dynamic entrepreneur and a skill development specialist. She is the founder and CEO of Leap, which is Learning, Employability, and Progress. Leap is a skill development organization that focuses on providing both lifelong skills as well as sector-specific skills to students, allowing them to create careers of their own choice. Welcome, Megha. Uh, next panelist on, uh, uh, for this particular session is Sean Blacksweat. Uh, Sean is the head, currently the head of international growth uh, at Joya Communications, which are the makers of MarcoPolo.me, uh, the video chat app for busy people. However, many of you may know Sean as he is the co-founder of BabaJob.com, an Indian job site for aspiring labor, reaching 9 million applicants and 500,000 employers, which was acquired by Quicker in June 2017. Previously, Sean was the third founding member of Microsoft Research India and helped design the user interface of Windows Vista, Office 2003, and XP. Glad to have you here, Sean. Finally, introducing uh, our moderator for the session. Uh, our moderator is uh, Mr. Amit Agarwal. He's the CEO and of the IT, ITES Sector Skill Council, NASCOM. Uh, Mr. Agarwal is also the co-architect for the ITITES Industries Future Skills Program, which aims to reskill and upskill 4 million professionals and students in the new emerging technologies over the next five years in partnership with industry, government, and academia. He spent his entire career in the IT industry, worked with Genpact, GE, Accenture, prior to joining NASCOM. Uh, he has an MBA from IIM Ahmedabad and a BTEC uh, and a bachelor's degree in economics from St. Stephen's. Over to you, Amit, uh, for this very insightful conversation that we are all very excited to listen to. Thank you, Saurav, and welcome all of you fellow panelists. Uh, um, and thank you all viewers for listening in. It's going to be an interesting conversation today. And I'm going to start straight with Kamya and ask her to really explain what exactly are societal platforms. <laughs> So, um, so you know, it's uh, it's very you'd be hard pressed today to find a company that doesn't say they're a platform, right? Like everyone is a platform these days. So I think understanding the difference between a, a let's say like a public platform and a private platform might be a useful thing to do here. So I think the way we see private platforms is kind of a, a player who can link an individual to a market player towards the outcome. In our case of skills of higher skilling or higher jobs. Uh, and these market players can be everybody from, let's say, your skilled teacher 
uh, to your employer to you know a test certifier who will help you get to your higher skill or higher job and so that's the role of like a private platform and it's very powerful to be able to do that in a very hyper local way uh, and with a deep awareness of uh, of a local ecosystem and we need many platforms there's never going to be just one private platform that should answer all of india's questions i think the question between a societal platform versus a private platform uh, is are you building in a societal platform a tool or a building block or a piece of infrastructure that helps many different private platforms do their jobs better so instead of looking at kind of a public player as a replacement to a private player offering a service that a private player could have offered as well i think the power of a true public platform is in thinking about okay what is the bottleneck to actually having many different job portals or many and solve it that layer right uh, uh, and that's a very hard thing to do so so i think if we can frame it that way might be helpful thank you thank you kamya so now i'm going to ask each of the panelists one by one to actually give us some of their disruptive thinking on how platforms can play a much bigger role as we move forward in this whole area of skill development especially in the context of today when people are finding it impossible to get together in rooms and study in classes whether it's the higher education system whether it is our own skilling ecosystem that many of us are a part of people are struggling to find a way for a teacher to get together with students and therefore dry skilling and then subsequently the placement and all the other pieces so let me ask each of you in turn and i'll start with megha to start with her thoughts on what she thinks are a few disruptive ideas on these platforms thanks amit and um, thank you for uh, inviting me and uh, giving me a chance to be a part of this panel it's uh, super relevant i think the kind of conversations we're having and um, i can at the outset say that uh, as as somebody who works on the ground uh, leap skills my organization um, we have been in the skilling space for about 7 years now and we first started using technology in the skilling space in 2016 um and uh, over the last 4 years we've trained uh, over 50000 people most of them from low income households and 18000 people using technology aided methods of learning so i can what i can and i think it's it's uh, it's really cool to be a part of this panel because each of uh, each of you bring such unique insights to the table so i think what i can do to really use people's time well is to tell you what i've learned on the ground uh, and maybe that's the kind of unique insight that i can bring to the table uh the good news is that i think it works um and if we contextualize uh, everything that we are talking about starting from uh the content to the platform to how we engage with students to how we train our trainers keeping in mind the learner at the center of everything we do the good news is it works um so i wanted to start in you know these like um not so happy times with uh, with saying that i think it works and um in the last uh, few years we started with using external platforms uh we integrated our in class sessions with um uh with third party applications and blended them with that um uh, and over the years we began to realize that what we really need is tech solutions which are built completely keeping in mind the context of my student my learner and in the last couple of years we ended up building our own full suit solution which ranges from content to learning applications on the mobile uh to you know training dashboards to reporting dashboards um also in the last couple of years what i'd love to talk to you about is uh, michael and susan dell foundation launched a study on digital learning for english uh and through that they covered about 14000 students across the country um leap was one of the largest partners in that and we trained about 8000 students and my god we we fell on our faces about i'm sure an equal number of times before we reached any sort of a conclusion um there were all sorts of learnings you know ranging from infrastructure issues so my students don't always have phones uh to connectivity issues where the data is expensive and they don't have data to really things which surprised me um to be honest where parents of girl students didn't want their girls to be learning on the phone because they weren't comfortable with girls being on the phone for any purpose beyond a certain point of time um they were unfamiliar with online learning so my students are not used to learning online uh engagement formats need to be thought of because uh, i mean classroom sessions work good classroom sessions work for a certain reason 
um, you know, we have to think in terms of all of these elements coming together to reach an outcome. So what I can tell you is that data showed of these 14,000 people, data showed that beginner level students, which is the level of student we are largely catering to in the skills development ecosystem, showed a six times improvement compared with advanced learners through blended learning programs. Blended learning means like a, a mix of classroom learning and online learning versus purely on online learning where advanced learners seem to do well in. Um, interestingly, background factors like family income, parents' education uh, influenced the starting levels, but then did not ultimately affect learning outcomes and improvement. So that's the ray of hope. We can do this and we must. Um, in, in terms of what I think we really need to figure out is that classroom learning, long form learning brings together a whole lot of uh, types, formats of learning, right? We do mentoring, peer to peer learning. There's a personal connection. We are talking about confidence building. A lot of that happened traditionally in the classroom. And I think the challenge we are working to, you know, really now move past is that if I have to take my classroom element and bring that online as well, then how do I do that? Uh, so things like WhatsApp, phone mentoring, uh, in conjunction with what we traditionally call a learning platform is what we have seen is showing success in our classrooms. Also, interestingly, a powerhouse of a teacher in a classroom uh, doesn't necessarily, unfortunately, translate into a powerhouse of a teacher online. Uh, <laughs> and we absolutely have to figure out uh, what and how to train our skill development trainers in such a way that they can translate all the intrinsic knowledge and the passion that they do have but are able to translate that effectively uh, through a platform, through digital learning. So I think um, the largest point I'd like to leave the group with is that programs, everything that we're talking about, platforms, solutions need to be designed, keeping the learner at the heart of every solution. We can't pick something that we've built for a private school or for you know, a, a student sitting in Delhi University in, um, and then hope that a student sitting in Pithoragarh in Uttarakhand uh, in a remote village, we'll know how to, you know, deal with it and it'll be effective. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I'd just like to uh, leave the group with those, uh, with those thoughts. Thanks, Amit. Thank you. Thank you for that. And two very interesting insights for our viewers. One, that platforms already exist. And as Mega pointed out, they have one and there's many more across certainly the tech ecosystem. So the good news out there is that the technology is broadly in place. Our challenge is all the different things we need to do to take it across from cities and bigger towns into the smaller areas. That is one. And the second is the centrality of user experience in whichever form of solution we want to build. And therefore, that takes us beyond just technical people working on the solution to people who understand different aspects of design and user behavior. Super. Thank you for that. And we move on to Sean now. Sean, some disruptive ideas from you. Yeah, so obviously I've been working in this space for a long time um, and a believer in tech's capacity to do good and to transform society. That said, um, I think we have not fully um, embraced, if to use an odd word here, how much COVID is going to change all of our assumptions. India is at 560 million data users. So we're even before this went in, we're only at half of users having access to a phone, which means any of really the, the tech platforms that we're talking about only being available to half the population. And with 25% unemployment and growing that we're gonna see over the next year, I, I fully expect that number to shrink. You know, there was a thing from the, I, I saw a piece this morning, which is if you look at the homeless population of Delhi, 97% have not received any sort of government transfer. Over 64% have less than 300 rupees, period. I don't see how in such an environment, even at a 100 rupee a month level, people are going to pay for data. And so I think a lot of the assumptions that we've been making on our ability to build digital platforms are, are going to be massively called into question over the next year. And I think that's just the sobering reality that we have to bring to bear. Um, and so thus, you know, what do we do within that? And, you know, I think agility is going to be really important. I, I think 
we have a lot of great motivations and a lot of great aspirations in terms of how we deal with this crisis, how we solve many of the problems that India is facing. Uh, I rarely see enough data-based rigor to say, oh, we did a program to feed 70,000 people. We ran a baseline before then in terms of how many meals were they getting per day beforehand. And then once we went through either our skills intervention or NGO intervention, how many of these people feel like they have enough to eat now? And so I think as we go forward, we have to be much more rigorous. Even the best platforms that we have, right? There are authorization failures of around 40% as Rupin reported on Audar. You know, I, I'm just doing basic things like trying to set up my grandparents for UPI and I'm a really good technologist. I can't set it up on any of the four banks that they're using. And then I can only imagine, right, how somebody that didn't work in technology for the last 25 years expects to basically set this up so that they can ensure that they're gonna get the things that we know they need, like digital cash transfer schemes would be great in this space. Um, but I, I am worried that things are gonna get much worse before they get better and that we're gonna to have to be really transparent and self-critical, both with the government and every assumption that we have and test it. Um, and if we don't do that, I, I really fear we're just gonna keep pushing forward with the solutions that we thought were good ideas before the crisis and, and without having the rigor to adjust them. And in many ways, we may need to adjust them massively as we go forward. So I do think this is a great time for experimentation. I just hope that we have the, the courage to, to realize that many of the things that you know, I've advocated or others have advocated in the past may be totally wrong and that we may have many more things that we're gonna put forward that are wrong and that if we don't solve this, you know, we're, we're in for a really terrible decline. And, and that's the thing that that fear I think is very real in me. And it, it drives me to do more, um, but I, I don't think we should go in this you know, to use the American expression, in a Pollyanna-ish, you know, kind of head in the sand. We we have to think extremely differently and be rigorous about well, what we are saying and what's working and what's not. Thank you, Sean. So on the one hand, we already had enormous disruption, which leads to uncertainty. And what you have highlighted that in addition to the uncertainty that already existed in people's lives, there's a whole additional layer of that uncertainty that has come in on what will work and what will not work. So our ability to know the unknowns has actually reduced. So we have many more of these unknowns and we will need the courage to try different things, learn and change what we want to do. So I'm actually going to use that point to transition to Kamya where just before when we were all chatting, she highlighted that one of the big pieces is a Team India effort. And how do we figure where the government plays a role, where private sector plays a role, how we enable the private sector to innovate a little more. So yeah. I'm over to you for some of your thoughts on this. Yeah, so I mean, I think, I think um, what Sean and Mega uh, have really highlighted is there's, you know, there's optimism on the private side, but there's also an acknowledgement of radical change. And so in a very changing environment, then how do you think about what the role of the public sector should be, right? Uh, and so, so I'll ask you a question. Um, do you know when the CV was invented? The CV, like pick a century <laughs> at this point. So, so it was, go ahead. Do you want to take a stab? Anybody? <laughs> do you want to take a stab or like, I, go I, think, ahead. I think <laughs> it's certainly I think after the printing. <laughs> but certainly after print, but it was actually, you know, strangely, it wasn't invented by a business or somebody who's recruiting to hire is actually invented by Leonardo da Vinci in 1483, right? So I actually looked this up recently. And I think the CV is something that, you know, we all think of as a so core as a platform that enables so much to happen on top of it. It's been created by many different people. It has many different forms, right? Uh, you have digital CVs, you have written CVs, you have, you know, formats that are created by different people based on what they're looking for. You have an MBA CV, you have like, an engineering CV, right? And there was a, you know, a research CV. And so, but the CV as a concept was something that was proposed by you know, one person in that situation where they said, I need a way to represent what I accomplish. And I think this is the level at which in a time when you, know, you have to take careful steps for the government, uh, the level at which the innovation should happen is what does everyone need, right? Uh, everyone needs a way, let's say, to represent what they have achieved 
and regardless of what that is regardless of you know someone at, like mega at leap skills that's assessing uh, uh, the the value or or this different skill level of a specific community of students towards a specific set of jobs that they're aspiring towards they can use that but what is it that are actually that core kind of building block infrastructure level so i think at this time the role of government you know they're they're running short on funding they don't have much money right uh, and so it's unrealistic for them to kind of step in as a market player to become a giant trainer uh, uh, in you know in a bigger way than they have been uh, so what is realistic for them i think is to actually pause and take a minimalist but extremely powerful role in shaping markets um, and you know i there are many examples of what like the modern cv type innovations might be like one of those was something that we worked on in my previous role uh, at ixtep where we tried to come up with an electronic skill credential form which basically says regardless of what you've achieved and what standards you were assessed against there should be a way for you to represent what you've done in a form that's consumable by many different employers and many different uh, uh, issuers of credentials or certificates right uh, and that doesn't have to be something that every individual you can create uh, you know to speaking to some of shots concerns it doesn't have to be that the individual has to own a phone in order to put that in right you can create a network that that seeks to create some of those and that seeks to share some of those as long as you have kind of an ecosystem wide agreement on a minimum standard or adoption so i think so i think the best way sometimes to explain a concept is to is to say an example although the example doesn't define the concept but uh, but that's an example of somewhere where i think we can think about what are the public interventions that would really be game changers and think hard right uh, and not just attempt to plug short run market failures some of those might be things like broadband or connectivity which no one else you know can invest in except for the government in under you know special circumstances other players can invest in so those minimum kind of public goods are where they should be thinking about and disruptive but public goods thank you so i'm going to switch gears a bit i noticed one question on the side from one of the viewers asking the question that look the physical training has stopped what can i do so i'm going to ask our panelists here to now address this this question that i'm sure a lot of people have in who are hoping to get skilled by programs that maybe the government was running or maybe programs that they could have got on their own which today they believe they cannot access because of what is happening in the external environment and sean maybe i'll start with you this time that given that you actually set up a very successful platform at one point to address a need right that was very real and and it was hurting a much broader bulk of people in the population at the time when there was all kinds of stuff for white collar but nothing on the blue collar side and you had to solve some of that if you were to give one recommendation to an individual today what can i do to learn get skilled and get a job right in given all the context that they are in what would their recommendation be in short people that succeed in getting out of poverty um have confidence it's a belief in themselves that change is possible that um that they can achieve a better life that they have hope you know if you don't have confidence and hope how do you how do you expect to present yourself well in an interview how do you expect to say i'm going to risk the bus ride to go do an interview with an employer and the cost of doing it because i have hope that this will succeed and so more than anything i feel like and it, you know if you look at the marketing campaigns of job sites the world over they're about getting people to believe in themselves that change is possible that they are ready to do it and that this can happen and so if i think about you know the piece of advice that i would give is focus on the things that people can do to basically create confidence and a sense that they are in control of their lives find the story of somebody in their own community that suddenly started volunteering that helped made four other people feel better even though they don't have any money right now find the story of the person right from a rural community that suddenly got a job in the city and this is what he's doing and this is basically or she is doing and this is how she's maintaining that livelihood and so i think fundamentally people have to believe in themselves and and there are platform level interventions to to come his point that we can do to help make those things happen right there are 
amplifications of getting involved in civic organizations and you know research on gratitude that basically end up fueling confidence of teaching people skills and showing that they started out the novice but at the end of that process they actually know how to do something that this sense of an endowing everybody in life and, and to be frank india doesn't do this this well we have an entire system based on toppers and if you're not a topper well then you are something less than the topper rather than saying, listen, everybody may have different skills. The person who's excellent at dealing with angry people in a customer service line may not be the best salesperson, right? Those are two different types of things. One, one is very empathetic and one is about hustling. And so I think we have to do this piece of finding the thing that people can feel good about what it is that they do and giving them that sense of confidence and encouraging them to go find those things where they can gain confidence. And that then being the thing that shows that they can then go get that better job. Thank you. Megha, thoughts from you? Um, I actually individual, couldn't... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say that I have to echo everything Shana said. In the classroom, uh, we, like I said, we work with these young learners. Um, and I have to quote this example of this girl who's ended up being a role model for her community. She used to live in a small village um, near her, in Haryana, UP. Uh, she, used to, she used to take a local train to go back and forth to, um, to her college and uh, worked in the college library as, uh, um, you know, as a part-time worker to, to earn her fee. And uh, it, is, uh, it, it is fascinating to me that the first time she appeared for an interview, she was, she was literally shivering. She almost fainted. Um, and through just her own grit, her audacity to believe that she has to be able to pull this off for a family. She ended up with a job with TCS um, and, uh, and is now a role model for her entire family. And I think the key ingredient to all of this is agility, it's audacity, it's believing that it's okay to fail. It's almost like failing is a necessity. You know, if you don't make your mistakes, you're not gonna learn. Um, so I think my biggest advice out there would be to figure out what motivates you. What we are doing in one of our areas is the, a bunch of our learners are coming together to identify the problem in their local community. Uh, so for example, in Pithoragar, it's a primarily agricultural economy uh, and they, they are, they're struggling with food right now. So our learners are getting together in a group discussion to kind of figure out how to solve the problem. And through that, we're getting them, um, you know, an audience with senior people. So they have the sense of problem solving of, of you know, uh, believing that they're contributing to their world. So I think I would uh, echo everything that Sean has said, and I can promise that there are hundreds of real life examples in our classrooms that motivate me every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kamya, an idea from you for a viewer? I think, uh, uh, I think it's, it's almost unusual how much convergence we have on this panel. Usually there are more fights, <laughs> yeah, but, so but I think it's a good thing. Uh, and I think, I think it's telling that, you know, the only kind of, I completely agree with Echo Omega and Sean's like so much of this is personal when you say skills and jobs it's, it's about an individual kind of realizing what they want to do uh, with most of their time that's like a fundamental uh, you know human person question um, I think what I would add in terms of nuance there is that a lot of the scope I think because of what Indian society teaches is to search for a salary job or a salary role in search of stability and I think one thing COVID taught us is there's never really stability, right? Uh, uh, and, so, and so I think moving away from a conception of, okay, how can I get a secure salary job to actually moving towards the largest employer in the country in our like kind of quote unquote elite discourse of uh, moving towards entrepreneurship and you know, self uh, employment, I think is, is a shift that's already been made at most of, in most of India. I think it's just in our discourse because we're all mostly salaried that we tend to have this conception that it doesn't exist. But I think recognizing, you know, what will it take to uh, create skills that not just, you know, jump to jobs, but create skills that creates the confidence, as Sean said, that lets you understand what to do with your life in the current economic context that you're in. And that might be a job or that might be kind of a, a, a venture, like an individual venture with one or two, right? Most of GST registered businesses, I think 90% or something, have one or two uh, uh, people involved, right? And and so so this is the really like the heartbeat of India, and it's it's something that you know we should reconcile with. And when we're thinking through what are the initiatives that are needed, you know we should think from those perspectives rather than more of like a Western notion of like everyone needs to get into these big corporate jobs. 
it, I, the, if I may comment on that, though, the, the one fear that I have more than anything else is those are the exact institutions that during COVID are, are being hardest hit because they're not able to get government assistance, right? They're too small to basically avail of those things and they're losing their shirts. And so what I desperately fear is that we may see an entire generation that says, yeah, those people that took that entrepreneurial path burnt their savings and spent it on food. And when COVID hit, they were really screwed. They yeah. weren't part of a big organization that had to continue paying their employees. And so I do think there's a narrative. There's one just support that we need to give to these smaller entrepreneurs, but there's also a narrative that as an entrepreneurial community, I think is gonna take us years to rebuild that being an entrepreneur is actually a good decision for your family, it, given the risks inherently associated with it. And so again, I, I, you know, I've been obviously an entrepreneur for the last 15 years. I, I fully understand this, but it takes, it takes an insurance and a safety net that frankly, I think a lot of people are realizing what's much more faulty than they may have seen before. And so it is my desperate hope, to be frank, that the government steps in so that those people don't lose their houses and are not begging on the streets. And, um, and I, I do think we are in extraordinary times and I would say inflation be damned, uh, we have to make sure that people have enough money to eat. I think if I offer some good news here, Amit, if you don't mind. Of so, course. I think, so, uh, so for example, although I know we, many of us saw this stimulus uh, kind of announcements that came out in the last two days and were a little dismayed at, uh, at the level of support that was being provided. But what's been kind of heartening is to actually see uh, corporates who are actually at the end of the day dependent on some of these supply chains that end at the Kirana, which is like a one, two person establishment, think through how they can support the whole supply chain and think of that as a family that's broader than the typical employee circle. So one example, you know, we saw Unilever kind of come out with an announcement for ways and, and many corporates that we've been speaking to have been thinking about this. So I think, I think again, like it's about building ecosystems that solve for a problem. Uh, uh, and of course, not, they're not using that as a way to pardon the government because they have a, you know, they have a strong role to play here as well as a mobilizer, but, uh, but there is a little bit of good news, I guess, uh, from an optimistic standpoint. Okay, then I'm just looking at some of the questions that have come from the viewers. There's a couple on health and really saying that, now I'm paraphrasing here, but in the context, so there's a bit on screen time, there's a question in terms of how do you deal with screen time? That's why the blue reflection on all of our glasses. So <laughs> don't get the screen. But the big one really is that if you're talking about confidence, hope, motivation, and all around you, there's health challenges. So yes, there are tangible recommendations from this group here on how does an individual build confidence and hope and get going on their skilling journey starting today. So I need really strong, good recommendations from this panel. What do I do as an individual to get going today? In a word, volunteer. Uh, I think it's gonna be very difficult to get anybody to pay you for much of anything, but the societal need that we have right now is so great in so many places. We, I heard of one interesting thing. So Efl Esther Dufflo, uh, earlier this month, did a survey of elderly people in Tamil Nadu, right? And what was interesting is, uh, you know, one third of them fully didn't know why the health crisis was happening and what they could do and were simply isolated and alone. And she came up with basically a connecting then those elderly people that she discovered with corporate volunteer programs. So that everybody inside of that corporation simply had to make a phone call to check in on somebody that was you know, isolated away from their family. And this is a very simple thing, but obviously suddenly helps two people come together and, and gives a sense of purpose on both sides. I think and that's like the simplest thing that could be done with a phone call, right? And, and I think it starts with small acts like that. And I don't think it's reasonable that anybody can expect to literally go out and find a job right now. I think that's going to be incredibly difficult, but I think people can contribute very meaningfully in, in their own communities and, and hopefully get by until all of this is done. And the skills that we developed around seeing change and making change in our own lives and making change in others, I, I think then are very transferable into you know, the sort of change makers you wanna have in any dynamic, innovative organization. Super. So one idea is get out there and volunteer and use this time to build a different set of skills through volunteering. Mega, come here. Who wants to go next? I think 
think uh, I think if I can add, I think uh, one thing that is very clear is that every crisis creates a market shift, and they're always you know different of different kinds, right? But I think this crisis um, creates absolutely kind of new opportunities for demand that didn't exist before the crisis. Uh, and so I, so, I mean, some of the examples that we've seen at like a micro level have just been like the you know, 2000 odd self-help groups that have mobilized to kind of create masks, for example, right? And that's like a new immediate demand area uh, that has kind of been uh, uh, met by, by local entrepreneurs. Uh, and so I think thinking through uh, in, your, in your efforts to volunteer, as Sean uh, kind of outline thinking through what is the new world going to look like rather than what has worked for places around me in the past uh, uh, is something that might be beneficial and it's actually very hard because if you go to a kind of community you the possibilities are often limited by the exposure you know that like you know my uncle's neighbor's son has been stable because they've been living in Bombay and they have a corporate job and you know they seem to have a good life and so this seems to be uh, it, it's often based on experience but I think uh, it, crises show us that past experience is not necessarily a good predictor of future success. And that I think is going to be a difficult lesson to learn. And so thinking about what would the future need uh, in volunteering would, would I think be a helpful thing for somebody to go through. <laughs> Thank you. And Megha, the last one, and we have okay. so, left to end. So we'll give it to you. I don't have uh, fantastic words of wisdom. Uh, but what I think I do know is, one, I agree with both Sean and Kamya. Um, maybe a couple of thoughts that come into my mind is that most of my young learners, so in we conducted a positive viewing in an ecosystem and that's economic learners to do out there is get out of that mindset. The world is not pretty. Learn how to use technology. If you have one problem in your household or your community and try solving it sitting at home using technology, um, you know, have those uh, have those conversations with your par parents and grandparents where they're telling you that they sh you should apply for the next UPSC exams uh, because life is not going to be the same and they have to buckle up and be gritty because it will be, I still think it will be fantastic and there'll be tons of things to do, but they have to buckle up. Uh, so I think, yeah, start learning how to use technology, be okay with working from home, pick up a problem, solve it, be productive in the time you're at home if you can help it, teach yourself new things. I think those are the kinds of things I would, um, I would kind of veer towards. Thank you, Mega. So we have two more minutes. Would any of the participants like to make a final comment or should I wrap? Are there any other questions that we didn't address? Yes, so there is one around, I am in a rural area. Like you mentioned, I may not have access to the education and skills and technology. So what can I do? Uh, I can take a stab 